Uh, for those who are attending the business meeting for the first time, this is a very informal activity of AHIN. This is part of our governance process that we would have a way to meet and consult uh, our stakeholders. So as you remember from my presentation, our structure at the top is the network, and that's basically everyone in the room. And then we have two representatives per country who we call the working council member, one preferably from the national government uh, and the other one from the non-government sector like the academe. If you get two people from the government, then that would be ideal. So like in the Philippines, we have Dr. Eric Tayag and we have uh, SVP Jovi Aragona. And then we have the governing committee which is myself, Dr. Bunchai, Anis, Dr. Fazila, and Jai. We are the accountable people. <laughs> to the working council member, we're accountable to the network. We, we have made ourselves accountable to listening to what you need. So the purpose of the business meeting is to gather insights from the membership, the network, the working council members. What do you think are your needs for the next two to three years? Why do we ask this question? Because it's part of our planning that if there's a lot of uh, inputs coming from the countries and they want to have this training here or training there, then this is the time to express that. And that's the, that's the time when we put it on record and then we uh, undergo some planning even in the next one hour, we can do some gen general planning and find out how we can uh, deliver the uh, expectations of our membership. Good afternoon, Dr. Kidong Park. Please, please join us in front, uh, Dr. Kidong. So the, the, the business meeting um, is uh, an opportunity for us as a network to think through. We've gone through two and a half days of discussions, uh, hearing from our development partners, hearing from our own other ministries of health, what are they doing, what are their pain points, what solutions have they created to solve their own pain point. I appreciated our breakout session, our marketplace, where we listen to the MOH Malaysia, we listen to MOH Indonesia, we listen to DOH Philippines, and we learned something about what they're doing. That is the essence of AHIN. The essence of AHIN is just to learn from each other, starting from a perspective that we all are flawed. We are not perfect people. This is not a perfect government. This is not a perfect network. But we, we realize that if we bring our heads together, we share our experiences. When we help our friends, our friends will help us. And that has been our proven framework for the past 10 years. And before when Dr. Bunchai said that the first time, I told him, are you sure? <laughs> when we help friends, friends will help us. But now we are sure. Over the past 10 years, we have seen countries asking each other, uh, do you have a solution for this? Do you encounter the same problem? And what did you do about it? That did not exist prior to uh, our creation of the network. So I'm happy that we were able to create that environment that we can, you know, you can ask Ahin, who do I contact in the other country? And we can help you look for the right person very quickly. So I'll pass the mic now to Jai. And Jai as the lead of this session to help us with the progress. Thanks, Alvin. I think, I think without spending much time, let's move into the discussions now that we are in the post-lunch session. And uh, as Alvin said, like just wanted to summarize that is, this is the time that we would like to hear from you and then explore opportunities that we could, how we could work together in the next few years, starting from uh, the next year. So uh, early this morning uh, over uh, breakfast, uh, we had a small group meeting. And one of the proposals that we heard was to gather uh, civil society organizations in each country and, and make them part of the network. Okay, maybe a few words from uh, each of you to just uh, 
tell us about some of the things that are happening uh, from your own perspective, from your or own organization regarding digital health. About two to three minutes, Dr. Park. My name is Dr. Gidong Bak. I'm the director at the Data Strategy and Innovation Group at the WHO Western Pacific Regional Office. This topic, digital health towards universal health coverage is clearly my first priority of my job. And that one of the top priorities in the WHO in the region, I'm also sure it is also top priority of the WHO in the Southeast Asia region. We are back and then we will go together with you, AHIN and then all the countries to us to realize the digital health to support countries journey towards universal health coverage. I'm ready to listen to you and then I'm ready to think about how to support country, how to work together with AHIN. So it's, uh, please tell me what you need uh, from the WHO. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kidam Park. Merrick would you like to share a few words. Hello again, everyone. Uh, Merrick Schaefer, Senior Digital Health Advisor at USAID based in Washington, DC. It's uh, been so much fun over the last few days getting to uh, meet all of you, learn about the projects you're doing, see the progress that's being made, and uh, reflect on what 10 years of commitment to uh, uh, seeing if we can help each other can lead to. So um, as I mentioned yesterday, USAID has launched its digital health strategy uh, for the entire agency. Uh, and we're really trying to reshape the way that we program our finances to better align with countries' goals and priorities as they you know, fit with UHC or whatever the priorities are for that, for, for that country's uh, uh, own, own interests. Uh, we're trying to encourage that, that, that drive towards standardization, then that drive towards architecture. Uh, we're trying to get the world on fire if that's the, if that's the choices that the countries, countries make. And uh, it's just exciting to see how many countries, I was, I was blown away by the, by the feedback this morning about how many countries were using fire, were using um, uh, uh, ICD, were using national IDs. Uh, that, that foundation, I think, will go a long way to um, uh, enabling us to actually achieve interoperability. I heard the questions earlier today from participants saying, do we have the example? Has anyone actually uh, uh, gotten the holy grail? Have we achieved a shared health record where everything is linked together? And I think that most countries are still aspiring towards that, but that we have that shared vision is what's so important. And we're building all of the steps along the way to get there. So I'm looking forward again to hear from all of you here about what are the best ways that we can leverage this network, this cross learning to, to help us achieve that shared vision. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Medic. Sean, over to you. Great. Thank you very much. So Sean Blaschke from UNICEF. I also uh, lead uh, the uh, Digital Health Center of Excellence, or DICE. Uh, and so some of this is going to be a bit of a repeat from uh, Monday and Tuesday. Uh, but we're really, again, as UNICEF, looking at the role of digital within primary health care uh, and uh, looking at our investments, our strategy, our collaboration with, with government and partners, uh, not in terms of supporting immunization and then nutrition and then maternal health, but more um, as part of a you know, multi-sector digital transformation effort. Uh, and looking at the health sector and digitalization as a whole. Uh, and again, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, no single agency can do this alone. Um, you know, I think as UNICEF, uh, we're really working to identify our comparative advantage in this space uh, and how we can work alongside agencies like WHO, USAID, and others to contribute to a larger outcome in the health space um, that will impact our priorities, but uh, align with governments larger visions for 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 UHC. Um, so I think you know as we as we talk about uh, AHEN's role, um, I think like Merrick, uh, you know, I came in already impressed. Uh, I, I think the the last three days has has, has shaken me more than I expected. Um, I, I, I didn't know how impressed I should have been. Um, so unfortunately, <laughs> I, uh, I, I honestly, um, I mean, the 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 achievements that this network has put together and huge kudos to WHO for their vision and foresight back in 2011 uh, and uh, all of the um, governments, uh, all of the partners who uh, put AHEN together uh, back in a 
you know, a, a, a very wild time uh, where partners were not being coordinated before standards, before um, many of these things that have become normalized now even existed. Uh, the vision, the leadership uh, that, that, that everybody um, put in over a decade ago, uh, you know, really has resulted in some tremendous achievements. Uh, and, uh, you know, I hope to steer this discussion around how we can leverage, um, you know, again, your capacity, your experience uh, for other regions uh, who are uh, not as far ahead as uh, what, what, what we've been learning in the past few days. And so, um, you know, very, very, again, excited. These are things that I've been talking with Jai and Alvin and others around um, enabling uh, additional networks in, in other regions. Uh, and. Uh, Really helping helping the you know team here. I would say cross the finish line, but digital transformation doesn't have a finish line. Uh, so move you to the next next stage in your in your respective journeys. Thanks. Thanks, John. Thanks, John, for bringing up the origin of Ehin. And that reminds me that Mark Landry is online from the Global Fund. He was instrumental in the I would say in the birth of Ehin, in the formation of Ehin when when he was in Vipro here. Mark, over to you. Uh, great, thanks, Jay. Um, look, uh, now with Global Fund, I'm super excited. And, and again, like Sean, I don't want to repeat some of the things I had uh, mentioned over the past two days. But uh, you know, in essence, uh, we need AHIN. And um, I outlined a few areas that I felt that uh, we could intensify our collaboration with this network. And those are basically around gaps. Uh, we're all in. This is exactly the, the template that we want to apply. Uh, to the 100 plus countries that we allocate grants to, basically. Uh, so there's a, so much tremendous value and experience in the Asian continent um, and even subregions, as well as what we see is uh, reusable and applicable to the rest of the world, particularly Africa. Uh, so we want to continue to build on that. And we've launched a, uh, an initiative around exactly that. I mentioned the other day about some of the intensive work we'll be doing in six countries, including uh, several in, in Asia, plus, uh, you know, opportunities around that. The second thing is, um, I really like uh, the experience that I have been a part of, but also have witnessed with what I now refer to as an applied learning program of digital health transformation. And the way that AHIN has been able to um, set expectations for individuals who are trained, as well as uh, trying to grow the competencies and skills of institutions. And so we want to begin a journey with AHIN to better institutionalize these kinds of capacity development programs around uh, structured uh, certificate courses like TOGAF and, and COBIT, uh, COBIT-5 and even PRINCE-2, et cetera, but also around um, you know, the digital health um, planning program that USAID and PATH and others are supporting, as well as many, many others. Um, so we're looking for opportunities for twinning, uh, you know, using the, um, the approach that AHIN has with, uh, you know, bringing the civil society and academic sector along with NGOs, with the ministry to make this a whole of society approach to digital health. And the last one I wanted to mention uh, is uh, we need to have a standards and interoperability lab in Africa. They don't have it, they need it, you have one, we want it there as well. So we're going to be supporting that. Uh, we're doing that through DICE, uh, where uh, Sean is, is leading that effort, uh, but we want to intensify with financial resources and uh, you know, have some really concrete uh, reusable assets eked out of AHIN. Um, I, I remember, I think it was yesterday, where Alvin said part of the agenda for AHIN uh, this next year, the next couple of years, is to do exactly that, to, you know, create these artifacts from all of this experience uh, in, in more systematic ways and, you know, create those lessons learned and make that more available to the rest of the world. Happy to be a uh, part of AHIN. Sorry I could not be there. Looking forward to intensifying our collaboration. And more importantly than all is to make sure that a Global Fund can work with AHIN and other partners to ultimately make a difference uh, at country level. And that's the end goal, right? So we want to uh, help you strive towards UHC. For us, our focus of course is on uh, HIV, TB and malaria, but that is a wonderful entry point uh, to eke out a lot of reusable uh, transformation across the whole health, health sector. 
thank you so much. I can't wait to hear about your ideas and want to help in any way we can. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mark. And then I could see Leah Mattel from Foundation PFAP. Leah, could you introduce yourself? Thank you so much for giving me the floor. I'm Leah Mattel. I'm working as a project manager for Foundation PFAP of PFAP Foundation. Um, maybe just to give a little bit of background, because I don't know how much you know about the foundation. Um, so we were working in France, um, and our uh, intervention uh, areas are Africa and Asia. Um, and talking about digital health, uh, we do have a foundation digital health strategy, uh, which has three pillars. And one is training and capacity building for both health professionals and leaders. Uh, we are doing this in Africa through university diploma, as well as supporting digital health departments within ministries. Um, we have um, national programs as a pillar, uh, which means we are currently supporting health authorities in West Africa with tele expertise, uh, tele dermatology in four countries, tele ultrasound starting at the end of the year uh, in one country. And the third pillar is capitalizing and sharing knowledge, uh, for which we have created back in 2016 the national, uh, the um, sorry, global uh, South e health observatory. Um, so I think AHIN is the, the perfect partner, uh, especially for training, capacity building, and capitalizing and sharing knowledge. Uh, the, the, the other thing I may um, explain is that historically the foundation has programs in Lao PDR in Cambodia and Vietnam. Uh, it's most, mostly drug specialist and midwife training programs. So depending on their needs, uh, we would like to continue to provide support to these countries and develop our support in e-health in these countries. But we also are very open to supporting other countries based on the, need, the needs they would express. Uh, well, looking forward to hear from you all and, uh, and, yeah, and to develop partnerships. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. And then we thank the Foundation PFAP for being uh, our partner since uh, October 2018. So, and then we, I, I could see Dr. Arin Detta from the Health Sector Group of Asian Development Bank. Dr. Arin, could you introduce yourself? Thank you. Uh, sure, sure. A senior Health Specialist at ADB. Um, I actually work uh, more on our health financing side, but uh, I was uh, very happy to get this invitation to talk about ADB. And of course, we know Ahin very well. It was good to hear Mark uh, talking about uh, this. Still A, the um, Standards and Interoperability Lab, which we um, worked with AHIN to start up and have uh, funded in the past. So that if, if it continues in Africa, that's a win. That's a, that's a big win for us. That uh, idea has roots in other places. So uh, I think ADB is, of course, uh, really a big champion of AHIN. And uh, you know my colleagues have been working with you for some time. And we continue to hope uh, for future engagement. Um, and we are are also pretty big supporters of digitalization and, and health information systems, modernization. So we've got a lot of uh, projects ongoing um, and a lot of uh, resources, I think, are planned also to be invested in this space. So I think the folks in the room, uh, I'm sure those are the kinds of people uh, we'll be working with. Um, a few uh, quick initiatives that I just wanted to highlight. Um, one is, of course, our digital health implementation guide for the Pacific. If you haven't uh, seen it, um, Maybe it could be a good resource. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a piece of um, knowledge that we developed working with a lot of different partners, and it's a step by step guide to launching um, large scale projects in digital health. Uh, we're also investing a lot in open source. Uh, I see Saurav is here. We've been talking uh, in parallel about open source technology for health financing, but also for social protection. It's a sub area of, uh, I think, the interest of the room uh, here, um, but I hope uh, an area that, that can really put into practice some of these ideas around interoperability. So a lot of exciting ideas coming up there. And uh, next year, so this is the second initiative, we'll be running some innovation challenges. 
uh, around uh, technologies for digitalizing health insurance, uh, for digitalizing health financing, not just payments, but hopefully uh, innovative technologies that can uh, link up national ID, CRVS, and, um, and payment systems, including insurer systems. So that's one. And the other area of technology that we're hoping to do some innovation uh, challenge around is uh, technology for primary health care that can help us deliver more complex and, and uh, chronic care at uh, primary care facilities. So it could include telemedicine, digital diagnostics, and um, remote consultations. So an exciting time, really, for, for us in Asia Pacific. Uh, a lot of uh, movement, a lot of deals happening. And uh, I think both from our sovereign, meaning public sector, as well as our private sector financing, we look forward to investing in digital health. Thanks. Thank you, Erin. I could see uh, uh, Saurabh Bhattarai from GIZ. And Ehin has been working together with GIZ for Open IMIS. Uh, request uh, Saurabh to introduce. Thanks, Jay. Um, hi, uh, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Saurabh Bhattarai. I work for GIZ um, in the Global Initiative, Social Protection, Innovation, and Learning, um, particularly focusing on, on the global good, Open IMIS. Um, so it's it's a pleasure to be here, and we've been working with um, Ahin for, for a long time now, um, together on, on helping countries understand what Open IMIS is and how it could fit into um, their um, visions of UHC. We understand that UHC is, is very complicated. It's not about one type of health financing scheme. Every country um, and scheme operator has their own needs. Um, so what, what we've been doing on our end is, is making the software more modular and adaptable so that um, different types of schemes could be uh, managed by it. Um, so in the recent days, we're um, we've been working on launching the formal sector uh, module so that not only um, can open IMIS manage um, informal sector contributory schemes, but um, we know that a lot of countries are going towards formal sector schemes as well um, for the, for health insurance and, and other social protection benefits. So um, we've been focusing a lot on that, um, as well as interoperability, as Arin just mentioned. Um, we've been looking into linkages with other social protection um, tools, um, for example, uh, foundational tools like MOSIP for ID and, and CRVS, because um, all, all of these need to be linked for, uh, for a system that can really help achieve UHC. Um, so we've we've been focusing our efforts on that, and as well as looking into supporting um, social protection schemes on top of health uh, programs as well. So uh, managing cash transfers and all of that has been a priority for us as well. So um, we we look forward to continuing with Ahin in in the days and years to come, um, and also looking forward to engaging with you, understanding your needs and and helping you see where Open Imist could be a fit in, in your UHC needs. Thank you. Thank you, Sauro. Thank you, Dr. Kidang Park. Thank you, Merrick. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Leah. Thank you, Arin. I hope I missed anyone else. And over to you, Alvin. Uh, take it. Thank you, everyone. And for the next part of uh, the program, uh, I'd like everyone to uh, get a pen and write down what imagine this is your birthday <laughs> imagine it's your birthday and you are being asked what do you want for your birthday because this is the time for you to ask Ahin we think this is something we would like Ahin to help us with in our countries so I think that's a very simple way to you know like and I'm not promising I'm going to give it to you <laughs> I cannot I cannot. That That's why we have partners at the background and then <laughs> online because I, I, I think it's just too big. It's too big for any one agency to do everything by themselves. Mm -hmm. But if we, if, if we come together, if we come together and plan it well, and there's a cl clear roadmap, and we're able to convince the partners that it's a credible roadmap, I think we can get our birthday wish. So that's what I'm asking you all to do. For uh, the benefit of Dr. Kidong Park, because he just arrived on the third day, some of the things that came out were from the audience during the first uh, two and a half days was so in Ahin we have what we call mind the gaps, meaning we 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 are uh, we advise our members mind the governance in your country, 
mind the architecture or the blueprint because that's important uh, as a reference point for every stakeholder in the country, public and private, on what we're trying to build. Mind your people and your program management because all of these technologies are practically useless unless there's, you have the right people with the right level of capacity to manage the technology that they will be responsible for. And mind your standards. Because unless we have standards, then interoperability will be a, I don't know, a pipe dream, yes. So GAPS is GAPS. And over the past two and a half days, and I'll ask the audience later on after I go through some of the wish lists that I heard in the past two and a half days, if I missed, if I missed anything, I'll open the floor later on and you raise your hand. First, on governance. We think we need capacity building on governance. And the course that we're taking right now is Digital Health Planning National Systems. That is a program uh, I know that WHO is also has, has co-designed. And I am, uh, Jai and Fazila have finished it. I'm undertaking it. And uh, we are really liking it because it has, you know, the, 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 the concepts, the inputs, and the process. And the question I had uh, uh, earlier that I heard was, this is for national planning. Can it also be used for local planning? Because one side is getting the act together at the national level, but on the other side, there will still be the huge local systems that we have to deal with. So I'd like maybe Merrick to just say something about that. Digital health planning, local systems. So I, I was thinking about this because it's such an intriguing idea. Um, and there is so much value at that local level. And I've talked to Derek uh, at WHO about this as well over the years. Um, and if you think about how did we pull the information together for this course, it was by engaging the global community that practices it, right? So this isn't, it, it very much came from the global, global community of practitioners, which then made me think if we're trying to do a local systems course, we have the big question of what is the right set of information that the uh, uh, LGU units here in the Philippines or local governments in other countries need to be able to plan around. What is the balance between the federal responsibilities, the national responsibilities, the local responsibilities? What is the ideal architecture or what are the common architectural patterns where you have local systems and you've got national systems? How does cloud and cloud provision fit in that? How do SLAs fit in that? And it goes on and on. And there's so many questions and thoughts that come to my mind when I start thinking about this. But I think the answer is in this room and in the work that people are doing. And so I guess maybe the question back uh, is, do we have enough knowledge collectively now to start defining some of those distinctions between what should be in the federal or the national space and what should be in the local space? How do we capture that knowledge? Is it a series of workshops that we can do to capture the best practices? And then we could turn that into the relevant material. Maybe we could audit the current course and say, okay, this, you know, 80% of the content of the course is very relevant for, for the, for the uh, local government planning, but 20% of it's not. We add in those best practices, and then we have a nice mix. So that's something that I'd be very interested in pursuing if others are willing to help build it together uh, or with us. Thanks, Merrick. I think I, I really like this because I think how the course, it depends also, also on the contributions of those who have already taken it and then shape it further. So more case studies from the region or the local systems will be uh, from the alumni community will be fantastic. And that's one thing that I think we also need to engage the community. I think WHO has trained a few hundreds in the last year and then training in the other regions this year. And then right now there is a cohort from UNICEF DICE, about 200 of them, and then 100 from AHIN. Right now it's ongoing. They should be completing the course with certification and capstone project in December. So that makes it like between us, between UNICEF, DICE and AHIN, there's a community of 300 trainees. So how we can make uh, this come alive and then engage them in something more meaningful, Sean, like the, your, your thoughts on that will be very helpful. Yeah, th thanks. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna quickly touch on kind of two things that we're doing um, differently this year and which I hope we learn from and do um, even better next year. Uh, so one of the things that we've, we've, we've changed um, is that uh, course participants uh, no longer are taking it individually. Uh, we've recommended that they take them as a country team. Uh, use this as an opportunity for the country WHO, UNICEF, World Bank, uh, Gavi, Global Fund Portfolio Managers, and government 
uh, all to take it together so that they um, come out of it with a shared understanding, shared lexicon, um, shared vision. And so I think this is uh, a great opportunity uh, for a uh, very local convergence, convergence of partners. Uh, the second aspect that uh, I may be even more excited about is uh, this shift towards applied learning. Uh, I took the course uh, about a year and a half ago. Excellent course, um, but you know the capstone project, um, you know, was was theoretical at that stage, and I had felt immediately this is a missed opportunity um, to get uh, us actually working on a real challenge that the country's facing. Uh, so with this round, we're piloting this new applied learning uh, again uh, next year with with additional support from Global Fund. Um, and to, to really look at testing this model on, you know, a country has a Gavi CDS proposal they're putting together, or they're doing um, maturity modeling. Um, can this multi-stakeholder team in the country, um, can they work on this shared challenge together yeah. Yeah. so that they come out of it with something tangible uh, and that they feel that this you know, does contribute to moving uh, the country forward? Uh, so uh, I think this paired with ongoing discussions around uh, the uh, postgraduate uh, network that uh, you know we're looking to AHEN to, to really spearhead uh, so that we don't lose graduates, yeah. uh, that we can capitalize, tap into uh, the, this expertise that you just talked about, these hundreds and hundreds of people, um, I think will be really, really exciting. Uh, and if we can find a way, uh, I was again chatting with Merrick about this last night, uh, to bring in um, graduates from last year, two years, three years ago, mm -hmm. and share how they've taken this knowledge um, and applied it, and where they where they've had challenges, where they where where where, where they ran into problems, and and how they've dealt with it, um, and uh, you know bring this to the graduates today and the graduates next year, uh, so that uh, this this network is a um, not not just a network that 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 cuts across cre uh, regions. Uh, but spans many, many years of successful graduates. Thanks, Sean. Actually, we had about 280 people applying for the 100 seats that we had. And then one of the key criteria that we had was like the intent to actually work together and support the ministries of health after completing this course. So this is something that we built in as a criteria itself. I would like to request uh, Dr. Kirang Park. Thank you. I understand question now is <clears throat> how to build governance system at local level, not only national level, uh, and then how to build the capacity of the members of the debt governance system. For me, uh, governance is uh, make right stakeholders sitting at same table or same rule, and with agrees and the rules and the procedures uh, to produce public good together. It could be digital health products, it could be local planning document on digital health. We need the capacity building program, we need training program. But we feel, we think, if we can only training, provide training for 100 people per year or 300 people per year, 500 per year, think about the number of the local governments. We cannot reach enough target so what we are doing now what we are planning doing now is that developing online online training course with self-paced open to every possible stakeholders starting uh, developing different level of the difficulties starting with basic level on this level and then after the intermediate level and then export level i think that with that approach we can complement existing training program intensive training on-site training for five days and seven days but with starting from online basic course i think that we can quickly increase the number of the stakeholders at the local government level to understand what is digital health and then for them to link digitalization in their area and then digitalization in health, for them to understand digital health is a good approach 
towards universal health coverage, towards the universal education, and then to address common threat of the climate change, etc. I hope we can develop, however, so to implement this, we need a partnership with AHIN, uh, with ADB, with the UNICEF, with the Global Fund to make this uh, accessible to, uh, to many things. Surely, so we can start with uh, some one language, English. However, so we plan to produce this language in many local country languages, such as Khmer, Vietnamese, Chinese, and French. Other countries, so those need this basic course of the online training course. It is uh, something I want to share with you, what we are planning now. Thank you, Dr. Kidampak. I could see Mark's hands up. Great, thanks, Jay. And I, I don't want to repeat uh, what uh, Merrick, Sean, and Kadong have said. Totally support and want to echo that. But I wanted to add two points. One, I think Kadong touched on something uh, very significant is if we're talking about local level, it has to be in local dialect and, and, and with local localization and so the, the language barrier. So I, I, I think complementing this with perhaps a training of trainer approach where uh, you know, with all due respect, I think, you know, typically we see more uh, English speakers functioning in public health at the national level, but if they could be empowered to, you know, then create these courses online or digitally formatted in, in video form uh, in, in, in the local languages to really own it and make it their own and, and make those available and or, you know, think about what institutions could bring this to the table uh, in, in, in the local uh, national languages or even uh, even subnational, so that, that that's number one. But absolutely agree about the the importance of you know taking this down a level. But I want to talk about bringing it up a level. So one of the things I've I've been talking with WHO about um, and, and 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 other partners is we, sorry I haven't been there in Manila to socialize this in the margins of the meeting. But I think you know this uh, course has been targeted kind of the operational level, the managerial level. Now we're talking about uh, subnational or localized level, but what about upwards? What about executive level? What about the C-suite type executives within parliament, within uh, you know, ministers of finance, uh, ministers of ICT, the minister of health, uh, the head of a, of a social uh, health protection program or social or, or health insurance program, those cotters of individuals and at that institutional level, at that um, uh, tactical level strategically, I think we also need to think about that kind of, a, of, a, of an initiative. Very brief, short, concise uh, program, maybe even just a half day. Think what we could do if we could get the attention of this senior executive level uh, cotter uh, to really become the ultimate champions uh, in, in everything they say and do has a digital aspect to it to improve uh, health overall. So I wanted to put that on the table, something we're interested in as, as well, to expand this into uh, that kind of a, of a very senior executive level approach as well. I want to explore that with partners later. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. Um, uh, for the others who are online, just raise your hand if you want to say something, then we'll, we'll call you. <clears throat> so actually, um, Dr. Kidong, <clears throat> we, I, I, I made that, I, I gave that question because it's about the governance aspect of our Mind the Gaps framework, but actually, it also connects to the P, the people and the program management. So are there any other suggestions from the floor? Which list, Dr. Palita? I think uh, the, uh, the mark, uh, they mentioned a very important thing because actually under the, this, uh, this detail project, which uh, uh, this GFA team supporting us, uh, we are uh, trying to develop this uh, uh, HR development plan, capacity development. We, we are thinking about uh, two levels like, uh, one thing is uh, which you, you you for the higher level because the ministry of health they are top officials and hospital directors they need to understand this transformation this is really really important because unless we are going when we are going to discuss certain things taking decisions it's a, it's a really important that they understand the basics so that is one the second one which i discussed with you all also the lower level so we need to have a more longer like two day or hybrid version of this course. So I really agree with the mark about this and uh, really we, we can uh, work together, especially with this uh, as we, we want to develop this also in Sri Lanka. Thank you. 
Thank you. Any other over here? Governance and people management. So right now we have a very clear program right now is the Digital Health Planning National Systems. Merrick is open to exploring how to localize this because it will take some work, of course. But it's not, it's open. Uh, the possibility is there. Dr. Palita suggested, you know, like targeting really the people at the level at the top level because they need to understand what they're going to approve, what they need to decide on. But we also need to reach the people also on the ground because they need to they, they will inherit all of these uh, new applications and new changes. Any more suggestions from the floor? Yes, Dr. Pazila, Malaysia. Continuing from there, so if we can have a, a executive level, management level, operational level, a tree level, I think we tr uh, we tried doing that in Malaysia for sub cyber security training. Uh, we had a module for just three hours for all the top management to give awareness. That uh, top management the executive will be more for awareness, a little bit of knowledge. The manager level is more for knowledge. A little bit on skill the operational level is also skill so if we can do something like that not only for dh and pns but for any training programs thank you dr fazila i think uh, dr kidan park i remember like a few months back when he was in contact with ahin he had suggested something uh, for regional uh, contribution of content and the regionalization of this course so maybe you could share something on that thank you so before I enter answer this question, so, so, so let me respond so, to so, Mark's suggestions of both, and then so, <clears throat> the comments from Sri Lanka and then Malaysian colleagues. I think in addition to the training executive level, maybe it's as a, for our job is not training them, our job is advocate them. We see uh, leaders uh, championing in digitalization of the society and then digital government. But some cases uh, we see where is the health? But for them, uh, they understand the benefit of the digitalization. And then industrial revolution, our job is to advocate them. Please don't forget health. And then for future society, digitalized society, health and the well-being, good should be as a top priority, not the economy only. And then the, <clears throat> for your question, and then as I forgot to mention, it's a, so training course, uh, the ratio, yes, so, so we can develop the sum, and then so, so we can uh, offer some trans in, translation to local language. However, I believe the so, content course uh, should be adjusted so, uh, reflecting local context. But that uh, only the ratio has uh, cannot make it happen. I need partnerships uh, for the AHIN and the other countries uh, to provide some module, considering a generic module. We can just adapt so, so something developed by the ratio or something developed by the ADB or UNICEF, but we need the input from the local. But how about? modify this or just this uh, if you deliver this message like this we welcome this i think that this is once we start a kind of the standard module so we can generate we can replicate uh, these training courses uh, so with a different context different module and then adapt it to local context and the local language i hope we can start uh, a big partnership with a great ambition. Target is to provide basic training for most of the uh, stakeholders at the local government. Here in Beta in Filipino, I see, I assume it's uh, more than 3,000 local government units are there. Uh, we need to approach them. We need to have the right stakeholders to have a basic understanding and then the our support for digitalization, digital health. We need to move together very quickly. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nangpong. Dr. Bunche, you would like to say something? 
Hello, Dr. Kidong Park. I'm Dr. I'm Bun Chai. Uh, we never met, but uh, we heard uh, from you. I'm the chair of the Asia e Health Information Network. Uh, yeah. When we're talking about the training and what come up to my, he my head is that we just talk about the cast loop, you know, but uh, actually what we have done uh, in Ahin before is the visiting tour. And actually, uh, they have, uh, we, we, we have done in several uh, occasions that uh, some uh, middle managers or the operator or even the executive would like to see, you know, some country are uh, really success on uh, component of the uh, digital health. And there is so many components like the standard interoperability lab and also the architecture, something like that. And we can learn from each other. And what we have done uh, in the past, uh, at least uh, uh, two or three, uh, uh, at least uh, five occasion that uh, the developing partner support the country that request that, why don't we want to go to see Malaysia, how they do on the architectures. So this way, the developing partner can support those kind of thing. And we in the country can kind of the hail as the base that you can, can come. For example, in Thailand, and we do more on the standard and interoperability lab, our sand, sandbox, then why not uh, let our friend to see how we works? Something like that. That, that I think this is the, another way, not just the classroom, but actually to see what you really do. Thank you. It seems that uh, you read my mind. <laughs> uh, WHO is, uh, the one side is a secretariat, another side is a member state, and then our, our implementing arm of the secretariat is at the WHO collaborating centers. In the region and the global itself, we have just uh, a few several WHO collaborating centers on digital health. Actually, so we are discussing with them uh, to develop the kind of cross-country, cross-regional uh, uh, visiting program, uh, the study tour. It can be physical study tour, it can be virtual study tour, it can be hybrid format. That is uh, something we are on in discussion. I hope so we can share our concept notes, uh, uh, not today, however, so, uh, within the, uh, a few months. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Kirang Park. Actually, I would like to mention one such experience that we have had in Ehin with Japan. So we had um, Ehin Japan ASEAN uh, knowledge exchange program where we were able to visit and share the experiences from the region, also learn from uh, Japan. So this, is, this was very helpful. Thank you. I think I see Leah's hands up. Yeah, thank you, Jai. Um, just one comment, actually, because I, I'm going to do what you say in French. It's to push an open door. I don't know if you say that in English. Um, first thing is that I fully agree with what has been said about training and language. Uh, I really think this is the key uh, if we want to leave no one beha behind. And the second thing is that um, I think we need to have people from all of us because uh, they are complementary, actually. And um, apart from online training, which is uh, very, very good and very important to, to have, I think it is also important to make people meet each other if they want to, um, you know, have this chemistry and, and, and then do things afterwards, after the training. Thanks, Leah. I think... I think uh, uh... What you mentioned is very relevant because I remember uh, Dr. Fazila and myself being part of the live uh, delivery course for the digital health program. It was very, very helpful to just meet our colleagues from across the countries and across the different sectors. That was very, very helpful. I, I do see a hand from Sami from Maldives. Maldives. Uh, Sami is the permanent secretary in the Ministry of Health, Maldives. Thank you, Jay. Uh, I would just like to add to uh, what Boonchai has said. Uh, but what I find is that uh, in, even in WHO, like we work in regions. So some of us are in the Southeast Asia region. Some of us are, some of us are in the Wipro region. Yesterday, um, like during the AHIN uh, sessions, we saw that Wipro is working on the competence uh, framework. Uh, but then uh, we might be, we might not be at that stage in the Sierra region. 
uh, when we are talking about uh, the exposure visits or experience visits, I would like to uh, the team to consider that uh, we should think about uh, not not being within the region, but also uh, going to the exposure to be in areas where they have done a really good job. We've seen, uh, we've heard so much that Estonia has a good information system. We've got a good information system of good experiences, even in other regions. So uh, I think we should think beyond our regions. Uh, there shouldn't be like borders when we think about experience sharing. Thank you. Maybe think uh, globally, act locally. Maybe. Yeah. We've been hearing about Estonia. We should invite them in the next GM. Why not? Yeah? Or we all go to Estonia. Wow. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. Question. Yes. Dr. Ajudin, Malaysia. We've been in pandemic. We're still in pandemic. So there's a lot of playbook out there. So even WHO also have a playbook on disaster management. But uh, I work on the ground. What happened is we don't have uh, informatics playbook, you know, what system to use, what are the standards and things like that. You know, it can be quickly deployed, especially in low resource uh, areas uh, when it comes to pandemic. We are going to have well, climate change already here. So these are the things that I might want to see. Second one is um, about project management. I think in medical school, we are not taught about project management. So when we do, it's always on the job training. So the standardization is not there. Uh, I know uh, a lot of people here uh, from IT background. So you already have that uh, embedded in the school in your uh, syllabus so when i come into these areas uh, there's no standard project management so i'll just do on the job so always there yeah thank you is there anyone else who would like to share in this room or online thank you very much jai and uh, doc eloy so yeah uh, at the risk of sounding like a broken record uh, i'm gonna pitch again for localization <laughs> so uh, we we need to invest more uh, for the local government units. I share the sentiment of Dr. Fazali, for example. I mean, traditionally, the, the MOH, the DOH uh, are the planners, right? And then you have the mid-level managers, and then the implementers are the local government units. But for example, uh, Section 19 of our universal healthcare law requires the integration layer at the provincial and city level. So there is a big gap that we need to capacitate them, train them to also be planners, not just implementers of health programs. And I've already approached uh, Merrick about the possibility or plausibility of uh, localizing the digital health plan. And there's also a need, uh, of course, uh, if there's integration at the city and provincial level, a need for them to get assisted on how to do their own EA at the at their level at their own level too so we're pleading with Ahin to help us with that and also with the digital governance framework uh in all my visits to cities and provinces they have no uh, they have very little idea to zero idea about these things at all and of course if we're going to help them in the planning crafting of the digital framework as well as the ea uh, a little bit of funding maybe uh Dr. Bunchai, 1%? Was it 1% <laughs> earlier? Yeah, it's 1%. Um, uh, and then uh, partners. Uh, we need partners to help them implement uh, interoperability at their, uh, at their level. Uh, I like the idea of Sandbox, for example. If we can play around, the LGUs can play around their team, right? And then they can collaborate. It would really, really, really help us move forward uh, and push the envelope the farthest way possible by the local government unit. So we have already secured the commitment, for example, of uh, four governors and one city mayor. If AIN would actually take on the challenge, we have um, a commitment to deliver a roadmap for a big province down south uh, on a governor's birthday on January 2. So uh, they're willing to fund it, uh, at least part of it. They're willing to cost share. And this is going to be the first roadmap by a province in the Philippines, uh, EA, of course, digital framework, among other things. Thank you. So let me answer uh, for that. A big hand for pay for expressing the needs of the local governments. So actually, Dr. Bunchai, pay raised this to me before lunch. And I said, well, so what you want is a convergence of the people within the local, local government so that the local government can express what they need and the stakeholders around them locally, because this is not national, this is a province, would be able to hear from the leaders what their visions are and be able to contribute 
So that's actually part of what we also espouse in AHIN, that there should be a convergence of stakeholders around a common vision towards uh, universal health coverage and the proper use of information technology for that. I just wanted to go back to the point on, on the, the exposure visits and study tours. What um, I really support it, but um, one point that I would like to highlight is as development partners um, who are supporting this, we should also encourage um, countries to host study tours. Um, and and that's, that's something um, we generally don't focus on. Um, I, I feel we, we talk about um, you know, we should do a study tour, where should we go? Um, and, and then, you know, there, there's always these usual suspects, like places where we go. Um, but but um, hosting a study tour in, in our experience gives countries a lot of confidence in their own work. When someone comes and sees what they've been doing, maybe it's not perfect, maybe it's not the best health facility registry out there, but it is an implementation and they've there, there was a lot of thought put into it, and most likely many other countries are also in the same um, position. So they, they would appreciate having, looking at something that, that's not perfect and, and in um, comparable to their realities, then, um, then really going at seeing, looking at something that is absolutely perfect. So I would really encourage us, development partners too, to encourage our partner countries to host study tours, to, to welcome other people to see what they've been doing. And, and I believe it, it really gives a boost to, to confidence and the work um, in country as well. Thanks. Thanks, Auro. I think uh, Fazila has got yeah, some... Yeah, that is very in interesting. You see, our issue is uh, when we give funding, like for example, AHIN, we only fund the one who's going. But the one who's receiving do not have budget to, to do this. So sometimes we also have problems, you know. Uh, first, uh, you know, at least even to give like a token and then the time, food. So that is the problem the host country always have. And also to bring around logistics, uh, renting cars, van, uh, you know. So we only take care of the one who's going. But the one who's receiving is not in their plan. It's not in their budget. So I myself have uh, declined many because I cannot afford. I don't have the money. So, so this is another thing I think we must think. Yeah, we'll take, we'll take you up on the challenge, uh, Saurav. I, I see your point. In, I mean, this is a two-way thing. The, the one that's being visited and the one who's visiting. Traditionally, we've been supporting the visitors, but the host, I think we should start uh, organizing what is the requirement of a study tour or a exchange visit. Let's, let's work on that together. Thank you, Saurabh. Dr. Hashita from Sri Lanka, yes. Thank you, uh, Ehin, for providing this uh, good opportunity to, after the COVID uh, pandemic situation, it's a very good uh, and pressure time for all of us to gather like this. So what I suggest, uh, uh, apart from the comments we heard from the audience, so uh, we will, I will suggest that, that uh, we, as a region, we should be able to uh develop the minimal data set for a, uh, for the interoperability so that is a very important uh, uh, thing we need to develop some uh, minimal data set uh, all agreed so then we can uh, easily start the uh, data sharing uh, then uh, my another suggestion would be <coughs> let's uh, we can develop the fire developing and the deployment team within the region so then we can share our experiences and knowledge the, with the, each country to develop the country fire profiles. Uh, apart from that, uh, so but I feel uh, we need the accreditations of the expert regarding the TOGAF and COVID-5 for the governance framework, for the implementation of the government framework for the persons who are in the country, if the, they have in the accreditation, so then they can have a more power to implement those uh, framework within the governance structure. So uh, uh, finally, uh, I would like to say as Sri Lanka, uh, we had uh, the College of Health Informatics as like in other clinical specialties, we uh, established that College of Health Informatics in Sri Lanka uh, with the MD qualified uh, health informaticians. So uh, we will happy to share our uh, journey of uh, developing health informaticians to other countries. Uh, if anyone interested, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Asita. I think that's very important what you raised about the a big hand, a set. big hand. Yeah.
there's a lot of discussion happening on the minimum data set for electronic health record as well as telemedicine because I know a lot of professional forums are discussing it. It's just that probably we have to bring that discussion within AHIN and then do it in the region. So that's very helpful. And then I think I think Dr. Chancellor has his hands. Uh, Dr. Chancellor from the Ministry of Health, uh, Lao PDR. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Chai. This is my request specific for Lao because we just recently uh, completed the uh, the conversion workshop. Uh, it was also supported by the AHIN and, and all the technical people. We also complete the more technical uh, working group with different partners in our country. And we come up with the, which we call the, the draft of uh, national uh, digital health strategy. So I have, in order to start up the, uh, the implementation, I just like to have four area that based on the uh, GAPS. One area is talking about the government. So really we need to, we need to, sub, we need a, a partner to support on establishing the which we call PMO, Project Management Unit, within the Ministry of Health, so that they can start up to uh, stimulate activity to coordinate to working on that. The, sec the second area we're talking about standard, meaning that we, we, we need to set the standard uh, especially for the uh, medical terminology. Even though we have uh, long time ago adopted the ICD-10, but it's not implementing yet. It's only based on the long time uh, WSO uh, uh, working on the symptom and syndrome, we don't have proper uh, 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 ICD-10 or something like that. And probably we, we need also start up by the, to talk about the patient ID because of we have already basic uh, information on based on this as two, we have a community based information so that we can base on that to build on the patient ID. But I know this is only the idea, but maybe uh, some expert or support can do that. And another one is uh, in the workforce, I think for the uh, short term uh, uh, thing, we need the, uh, to train the champion or people who are specific for the uh, health informatics and health information because uh, in, in, in Laos, unfortunately, we don't have, we have only people who are you all the people who are trained specific, but they are not working on this area. They are working on other area. We are not they are not focused on this. That's why uh, the current staff who are working on health information uh, division in the Ministry of Health, just only the contractual staff and those people like me, we are just got the short term training, academic training, and we're just working on that. We are not people who are deeply understand the, the what is in health informatics. And for long term, probably we need to transform of the digital health uh, into the uh, curriculum of the medical, medical program so that they can have the train a mix of a uh, number of staff in our country. And the, the last uh, request from, from starting point, I think we need also infrastructure, especially for the expansion of the uh, uh, internet connectivity to, down to the health center level. Even though we, we have uh, connected to the province and, and district level, but now uh, for the health center level, uh, we are not connected because of we don't have. I, I'm talking because it's not, uh, we're not starting from the beginning, but it's, it's available uh, uh, partner in, in our country a lot of, it, but they are focused on more, more on service delivery rather than on the system uh, information system itself. We have the uh, ADB, we have World Bank, we have Global Fund too, but we have we need to work together to to focus on the digital information. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chancellor. Klube, you would like to say something? Thank you, Chai. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ehin, uh, for having the chance to put uh, so many people expert to have some sharing. I think that um, the e-health knowledge is uh, also very important for sharing and collaboration and also to uh, facilitate some innovation. And among them, the civil society is very important. So I wish that Ehin, the upcoming plan can help the partnership between the public and private sector, including the academic industry and also uh, all the civil society. 
So one of them, maybe we can uh, go ahead to um, to use the gaps, use a coil, use many um, enterprise to um, to uh, increase world trial and pilot project to be pioneer uh, some innovation project, health project in the Asia, and also have a reference for all, all other regions in the world. This is my uh, my view. Thank you, Dr. Moni from Cambodia. Yeah, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and especially uh, the people, uh, the noble people uh, on the stakes. Thank you very much. Uh, now we come to the end of the, the, the schedule and we could not uh, remember everything. We just remember on, on uh, digital health benefit for people, need support from all to join and to unite. This is one message from Dr. Monique Cambodia. And the second is the governance and interoperability need key stakeholders uh, involved based on the roadmap. This is a second message. And the third message is a hint for all together and together for a hint. So thank you very much for all participants. Yeah, we come uh, to the end. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mani. That is very helpful. Uh, I think uh, one of the key components of uh, you know the governance in digital health is uh, you know as what Transform Health proposed to to apply a human rights lens uh, to this you know the whole governance uh, structure. So um, I think there's a real gap uh, as we see because most of us actually represent the government sector. So the soft part of digital health, which is, uh, you know, how do we inculcate the culture of uh, digital rights uh, in, in applying uh, governance? So how do we balance uh, data usability with uh, individual rights? And I think although we talk a lot, a lot about uh, technology standards and interoperability, um, I think that is also something that uh, we from the government sector, because we work in you know, different political systems, different cultures, so I think it would be helpful uh, to have more exposure uh, you know, in, in, in that aspect. Thank you, Dr. Hamad. I, I can go through this list. I got a, quite a number of... Uh, um, some of them are repeating, but I, I'll read through them. So one is a request for more formal educational opportunities on informatics slash digital health to capacitate and attract talented staff. Capacity building and training. Uh, one, AHIN support uh, or service on formulating an e-health blueprint. I think that's part of our A, the architecture. Uh, we actually have a regional enterprise architecture council for health. These are the graduates of the TOGAF training program for each ministry. Uh, we put them together after they got certified and we uh, let them exchange information with each other, share resources. And I think uh, that's why we in the Philippines, um, we also have uh, acquired the professional services of an, an enterprise architecture firm because that was their assessment of what we needed in the country. Number two, consolidate country strategy in architecture and formulation of EL governance. Yes, that's the G. And number three, buy in strategies for people to consent and share their data. I think that's an important uh, topic as well. Uh, where it's like the third step. The first step is capacity building. The second step is data. And then the, the, the next step is the, the sharing of data. Visiting tour, we discussed this already. And that's a two-way uh, road between the visitor and the host. Need funding for capacity building training programs like uh, FIRE, ICD-11, Dr. Kidong, DHPNS, TOGAF, and PRINCE2. Resource sharing platform with categories of documents on e-health uh, from different countries. So it's like a, a repository, a repository of artifacts from different countries, guidelines, policy standards. It will help other countries, like what do they have over there? And maybe they will learn something from these documents. Uh, a bridging course for open, free and open source software. So I think this is like 
uh, something about what is free and open source software and how do we use it? How do we manage it? Ah, informatics disaster playbook. Mm -hmm. Project management uh, in digital health certification. Training of data science, digital competency for local healthcare workers. So this, uh, this is now the local side. And then study tours. So I think there's, there, there are some patterns emerging. This is very helpful. The more... The more inputs about the same thing, then that means there's a there's an interest from the audience. And what we'll do in Ahin is we'll organize this as an action plan in the next two to three years. Dr. Bunchai, Dr. Fazila, Anis, uh, any inputs? Uh, from the, especially the digital health uh, aspect, I think, we need also to consider about the inclusiveness of digital health. For example, a country like Indonesia, uh, I think we still have... Uh, about 10% of health facilities could not connect to the internet. So that uh, if, for example, we need to require all health facilities with digital health and then they could not commit that and then the existing health facilities, the traditional program, I think could not work. So I think uh, uh, there should be a balance about implementing the digital health, especially when we are uh, going down to the local level. We need also to consider those on the last mile of the digital and also infrastructures. That one thing that we need also to consider, and it is also relevant to health data governance, to the human rights, and also the ethical principles of implementing digital health. There should be a consideration about um, unintended consequences of any digital health in implementation. And also, uh, based on that, I think uh, after uh, one decade of uh, AIHIN, we need also to learn about failures, not only about the success of what we had so far, continuing the collaboration, the network in, in one decade. Is there any failure that we had uh, in the last 10 years that I think we need to prevent this on yes. the next uh, one decade so that yes. we hopefully could be better and better? Another uh, aspect that uh, I think uh, it's also relevant to learning, uh, how about to have more uh, personal and more uh, uh, close learning like mentoring. Mm -hmm. Mentoring sometimes uh, it will be better because we know uh, personally the mentor, the, uh, the leader that we would like to follow the step on digitalization. So hopefully after the training that currently ongoing, we could identify not only the participant, but who will be the next mentor for the next digital champion in the Southeast Asian region. It's like succession planning. That's, for, that's yeah, good governance. Yeah, good governance. So that uh, if we could identify this kind of mentor, so we could identify the, the process after the training, who will be the champion for the next uh, program. Like uh, I think we discussed about uh, uh but tot like uh uh for the digital health course yeah i think and i think uh yes uh, last thing that i just would like to remind especially about uh, indonesia um there are uh, more and more uh startup in 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 health technologies and even during the COVID 19 they could provide telemedicine easier and faster compared to the traditional uh uh, hospital or, or health facilities. How, how could we initiate partnership and collaboration? Because uh, I think uh, many mentioned about uh, in Indonesia, for example, we have the regulation on health facilities. But there is opportunity for, for the minister to decide if this kind of uh, technology could be a sign of a new health facilities. But then with the different a requirement they do not have uh, physical spaces but they have uh, human resources behind but we need to ensure the standard on impl on providing this kind of services and currently this kind of services only registered at the ministry of informatics so i think uh, working together with not only the uh, min uh, regulation at the ministry of health but also in the ministry of informatics is also important Next. thank you Thank you, Anis. Uh, don't you love this network? There's ethics, there's risk management, and there's succession planning. Portia? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I want to add on to the idea of inclusion. And while 
you know, the technical people keep on talking about, um, uh, you know, blueprint, may I, and even minimum data sets. I just hope that next time that we talk about it, there is really a particular focus for, uh, you know, broader inclusion, like where are the indigenous peoples in this community, uh, in this discussion. So it's not only the last mile in term, and in effect, they are the last mile because these are the people who are, um, who are uh, not reached. No, so but um, we've been uh, we heard that commitment that uh, henceforth the investment should be towards equity and human rights. So can it be also part of the technology language or discussions as well, so, so that it quick, is emphasized? A quick that answer point. to that question is that AHIN is so far away from the ground. Because we're a regional network. But over the past two and a half days, there was an, a discussion amongst the membership that there are actually national civil society organizations working on digital health. And we discovered that, you know, right when over lunch and over the breaks, that uh, like I, I'm with the Philippine Society for Digital Health. It's a 20 year old organization, mostly about the research on medical informatics, but they're, they're there. And then we have Digital Health Malaysia. Uh, the CP Wong is forming. There's Mongolian eHealth Association. There's Health Informatics Society of Sri Lanka. So maybe the, the answer to the question earlier about localization will involve them. Will involve them because they are the people who are actually operating within their country. But they might not have the pooling experience that AIN might have. So um, CP, you have any ideas about how we can form this civil society it's a community inside AHIN of civil society organizations. Thanks, uh, uh, <clears throat> Elin. Uh, I think that um, we have to look and see that e-health is a conversion of health and technology. I think we talk about on the policy level now a lot of time, but as we move up our social economic uh, development, eventually we're going to come from underdeveloped to develop and to, uh, developing to develop country where the commercial element will become increasingly more evidence so i think in this case here we have to include the companies and so on to come in for a public good i think so we can talk about actually donor alignment yesterday a lot about donor alignment we also can talk about uh, stakeholder alignment right i think and it's not all because people are after the money I, I think, trust me, I'm a doctor. I've worked with a, a few businesses where to them, actually it's more for the public. They're quite happy to come in. So I think that we can actually uh, sort of governize all this civil society to come in together and align with the policy of the policymaker. And we can do something that's more actually uh, effective, I think. So I think what I thought actually is that I think, and I'm pleased to say that within this meeting itself, the Malaysian, we have agreed in principle to try this idea, a stakeholder alignment and donor alignment. We're going to start with charter project. So we have I quickly put together some thought in principle so that if it doesn't work, we can get out. But we have agreed that we're going to have a, give a free child health record to every children born in Malaysia. We're going to bring in the academia, we're going to bring in the industry, we're going to bring in the MOH and so on, work together with the aligned on our actually the, the aims. So I think once we have that, I hope that next year we will come back to actually inform the AHIN and see if we are useful and we're going to put the gaps into practice. So by doing that, then we have example uh, use, use cases and then we can actually then bring forward where we real are. World, real world implementation of Thank gaps. you, CP. Yep. I think uh, we will have some final words from our panelists, both online and then who are on stage here. Maybe starts with uh, uh, Sauro. I think from from um, GIZ and OpenIMU side, um, we, we're happy to support AHIN and um, the partners in in many of the aspects that have been discussed. So I think um, the, again, like any other general meeting, this has been a, a real pleasure to be a part of. And, and we look forward to, to working with everyone together. Um, and please do reach out um, th through AHIN or to us directly um, if you think we can be of any support um, for your needs towards UHC. Thanks. Thank you, Saurabh. Leah? Yeah, um, it's pretty much the same. We're very happy to be part of this adventure with the partners in AHIN and um, it was a very interesting
interesting session for me. I wasn't there the previous days, so um, it was really nice to hear about the needs and to see uh, what uh, synergies uh, we could think of. And we are very much open to um, continue this conversation and uh, please uh, reach us. And, and we are very much looking forward to continue to support AHIN. Thank you, Leah. Mark? Uh, thanks, Jay. Uh, so uh, what I love about AHIN meetings is um, the passion and, of course, the brainstorming that comes out of this kind of a, uh, of, of a meeting. So I think the next steps, of course, are the prioritization of what to do next. Uh, and so I, I would I would recommend uh, that AHIN might consider you know converting some of these good ideas into a set of work packages, and then crowdsource and vote up uh, which one should be of, of a priority for uh, countries uh, to demand. So you capture that through that process, but also you know where we can all see uh, what are percolating to the top, and then us as a as a development partner and donor, uh, we can assist and, and try to provide support among those priorities that will emerge organically uh, from this incredible session, very rich uh, discussion and, and wonderful ideas. There's always uh, too much to do and not enough time and, and financial and technical resources. So I uh, really encourage uh, a prioritization discussion or a process around that uh, so we can match uh, the, the support that's needed given our existing priorities, but also I think there's a lot of synergies as we're hearing already between um, both across countries, but also between uh, what partners can do and are able to do and what are the, the demands. And, and again, again, appreciate the time to be part of this meeting and, and looking forward to next steps and working with AHIN um, in the future and better in new ways. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. I think Irene had to move on. So he has sent us a message. Let me read out. Irene says, look forward to more engagement through our teams. Thank you, Irene. And I would like to request uh, Dr. Kiran Park for, the, for his final words. Thank you. So during the pandemic, WHO used this slogan. <clears throat> we are here together. We can overcome together if we unite. I would adapt this with my closing remarks. We are here together. We can create a brighter future together. Today, we see huge potential of the synergy of the partnership and then WHO will continue to renew ourselves to demonstrate our added value to this partnership. Let's start go our journey together towards digitalized society with digital health. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. We look forward to work together with you. Uh, Merrick? Thanks. Uh, so I am deeply inspired by the last three days. I'm fired up uh, both standards wise as well as just passion wise. Uh, and I'm, I'm uh, excited to continue to collaborate and work with uh, all of you here uh, in AHAM. And I've been thinking about what I've been hearing over the last hour and a half uh, from everyone here in the room, as well as uh, WHO, UNICEF, uh, Global Fund. And it makes me think that there's starting to emerge in my mind um, a governance group that is defining an architecture to empower the people in a standardized way of learning. And so uh, it feels like there's a, a starting to emerge all of the pieces from the sort of we need the executive, the operational and the local. We need uh, uh, the, the hybrid and the online and the study tour, right? Like so like the, the dif different different patterns. And it, it almost looks like an architectural diagram in my head. And then we could work together to prioritize it, as Mark suggested, and then fill it in over the next few years. So thank you so much. Thank you, Merrick. Thank you, Merrick. I want to quickly echo uh, comments uh, that Mark made, but say that uh, I think we need to be focused as well on what we can deliver quickly and immediately so that we continue to build on the momentum today. Uh, I want to take similar excitement from uh, Merrick and capitalize on it before uh, another priority comes and distracts me. Uh, so if we can, if we can take things uh, like the in-country visits, uh, if we can break down the walls between regions and start to promote um, learnings, not in a year or two years, but let's, what, what can we do in the next three months, six months? 
uh, let's let's focus on that so that we really make sure uh, that that we continue uh, this 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 journey and uh, again not get distracted by the um, next next issue that comes up. So thank you very much. Uh, this was my first uh, and uh, um, hopefully now uh, regular uh, participation in these AHEN networks. It truly was an honor and a pleasure. Uh, and uh, looking forward to announcing hearing where the where the next one is going to be held. Thanks, Sean. I think it was wonderful to have you all in the panel and then those who have joined us. Um, by spirit and then um, uh, been with us for the last three days now it's been a wonderful journey i think it's time also to make the announcement probably yes. or we have something before so before uh, we announce i'll call pa anis i just like to thank our secretariat christine thank you christine please stand charise thank you. Thank jocelyn you. thank you Lukwa. thank you very much for the thank support you. we know this is successful because of you thank you very much Yay, now we'll call you. Pa Anis, Pa Anis for the synthesis and also the turnover of the GM. Um, a very, it's a very hard to uh, to give a synthesis. Uh, we learn yeah. a lot, especially today, and I think uh, the synthesis, uh, no synthesis, uh, <laughs> no synthesis could be exactly present what has been happening in the last uh, three days. I think uh, I would like to select uh sentence but i think the most important one is i think to follow dr fazila so now makati is on fire uh, or manila is on fire so that we need to keep this fire continue and then bring about the digital health in not only in in southeast asian region asia but also to the rest of the world and we need to have uh, this program to be continued uh, longer thank you Thank you. And so we'd like to call Pa Rudy uh, from Indonesia because uh, we are happy to announce that uh, the next GM will be in Indonesia. Pa Rudy, thank you very much. And I'll call uh, Philippines uh, Senior Vice President Jovi Aragona as the host to come in in front and hand the, to Pa Rudy. To Rudy. To Rudy here, Rudy. Yes, as a symbolic turnover of the ANGM to Indonesia. We don't know when yet, but it will be in Indonesia. I, all right, a big hand for everyone. And Indonesia, here we go. And a final message from Dr. Eric Tayag as we return to our seats. Thank you very much. Thank you.